Okay. So um, the consumer choice problem. Okay, so, so why do we study the consumer choice problem? The consumer choice problem is used in uh, incredible breadth, uh, a large number of problems in economics um, to explain the behavior of participants in the market. Probably the one that you would come across most often would be um, in finance, there's the savings and investment decisions of consumers or investors. That's a version of the consumer choice problem. The other one that you come up with is they call it the labor leisure choice problem in labor economics where people are picking between how much they wanna work and how much they don't wanna work, that's their leisure. And as a result of their solution to that choice problem, they figure out um, what the supply of labor is for those particular people. And I could go on and on and on and on. But, but this is, is, is one of the workhorses of um, economics. For our purposes, what we're most interested in is the solution to the consumer choice problem. Gives us, uh, and I'll just say data to construct the demand curve. So th this is our more immediate concern, okay? Um, and again, if you think about this class overall, and I talked about this at the very beginning of the class, the structure is we do this review um, of demand and supply at the beginning, and then we investigate demand and the foundations of demand. Where does demand come from? And then we do the same thing with supply. Where does supply come from? And, um, and that one in, for demand, it's the consumer choice problem. In the case of uh, supply, it ends up being the problem of the firm and uh, meaning business firm. And so we'll talk about that in detail. But yeah, we haven't answered this question when we're talking about consumers. We know the market level demand curve is the demand for all the consumers in the market for a particular good. So we can observe the market demand curve and we can break it up into individual demand curves or individual demand functions. But we haven't even touched on what it is that determines the demand that a particular individual has for a good. For us, it's all just been sort of intuitive and something that we've taken um, as a given, right? I, I talk to a consumer, and the consumer, I announce a price for something and they can tell me how much they wanna buy. And we don't get any deeper than that um, until now. And so there are really two pieces to the consumer choice problem. And, and the first one um, is, is pretty easy and it's what we call um, a budget constraint. And this gets to the issue of affordability. So 
one of the things that affects how much a consumer wants to buy of a particular good is their income and the prices of goods they might consume, right? So, so there's this idea that, well, um, you know, somebody. Price of my stuff. And oh, did somebody say something? Was there a question? No. Okay. So, and I'll ask you, Alex. Are you, are you here this morning? Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, it, just keep an eye on the chat for me, would you? If somebody has a question, let me know. Okay, Luke. Thanks. So, so um, yeah, I mean, it, it it just makes sense, right? That that for a consumer, when we announce that price, one of the things the consumer considers is, okay, how much money do I have? What's my income? And th this is, is kind of a little bit strange. If you think about the words, right? Um, income kind of presumes a flow of dollars and, and wealth is a stock, right? It's how much you've already saved up that you already have. But and so a lot of times we talk casually about income, but it should be clear this is income for the purpose of being available for consuming the goods. So a lot of times we'll also just call this the budget of the consumer for the goods in question. So, so the first thing the consumer has to do is they have to reflect on their budget, how much money they have available. And then given the prices of the goods that they're considering, how much of each of those goods they can afford to purchase given their income and the prices. And, and we summarize all of that in this budget constraint. So, um, the other thing the consumer obviously is going to take into consideration is their preferences. And, and this gets down to um, what does the consumer like or desire? or need or prefer. And, and so we just collapse all of that down into preferences. And so <clears throat> the, reason the reason why I, I say that is that um, this is supposed to be a universal theory of consumer decision-making with respect to economic decisions. Um, and and it's, it's really hard to classify decisions as being non-economic. So, um, and the reason why I say that is that you might've seen, for example, that we have a class in um, our, our curriculum it hasn't been offered for a little while because the faculty member that that used to teach it um, left just a little while ago, and um, but the the class is called marriage and the family, and when you start to talk about consumer behavior in a personal context, like who do we decide to choose as a, a intimate lifetime partner, a spouse, a husband or a wife, um, or 
when do we decide to break up with our boyfriend or girlfriend? Or uh, how many children do we decide to have? You might think that those decisions are non-economic decisions um, or what, what um, you, know, you know, criminal enterprise are, do we decide to get into? Are we gonna be a drug dealer or a bank robber? That kind of thing. You might think those are non-economic decisions, but it turns out that this theory uh, produces a, a whole bunch of predictions for how people will behave regarding not just purchasing tomatoes and tennis shoes, but uh, these other sorts of major life decisions. So, so um, then I, I hope that you understand the theory is comprehensive enough that, that sometimes we touch upon things like uh, whether or not a particular good is a necessity, a life-saving medication, something like how much insulin to use if you're a diabetic, for example. Um, so, so you might think to yourself casually, hopefully after you've taken this class and some others, you start to think more like an economist and you won't uh, use too many of the terms casually that, that people use in dinner table conversation, that this is a necessity and people have to have it. But you'll begin to think about it, well, there really are these trade-offs. There's this, this set of things that people can choose amongst based on what's affordable. And then how do they decide ultimately within that group of choices they could make, which choice to actually implement. And the sort of mystery of how you move from what you can afford to what you actually do is what we're talking about as preferences. So uh, that's just our nomenclature within economics. If you wanted to use a different term in your own mind, that would be fine. <laughs> but, but we're covering all of these things uh, by, by talking about preferences. Uh, and, and, and really, if you're really trying to disentangle affordability from preferences, just remember the preferences tell you not only what you like and what you don't like, but they also tell you what you would choose if you had every possible choice available to you. So that's another way of thinking about preferences. Your budget is constrained based on the amount of money you have and the prices of things that you see. But your preferences are not so constrained. I could ask anybody here, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but I'll just um, chat with somebody for a minute. And um, let's see, how are you doing, Sophia? Sophia, are you here? How about Taylor? How are you, Taylor? Me? Yeah, hi, Taylor. <laughs> Sorry, I know there are two Taylors in the class though. Oh, Taylor Humphreys. How are you doing? Doing Taylor? well. How are you? I know there's Taylor Peanut too, but I don't see him this morning. So, so, okay. So, which would you prefer? A zombie apocalypse or a nuclear holocaust? Probably the zombie apocalypse. Oh, very interesting. I should do a poll on that one. So, so um, 
and and why is it that you imagine that a zombie apocalypse would be preferable to a nuclear holocaust <laughs> or well, better maybe there's a way of coming back from it mm. so so you you actually think that that maybe there's some chance you want to end up with as a member of the horde but if there's yeah i see really the trade-off is a nuclear holocaust if it's if it's a if it's a real good one it just in a flash ends everything right it's just over so you don't draw it out but yeah the zombie apocalypse might unfold chaotically over time um yeah and and maybe you you manage to survive in some dark hole someplace where no zombies could find you or something i don't know but so the point that i'm making is you've never experienced either of these things right but you were able to pretty easily formulate a choice a, a preference over the two right do you do you follow me i mean you didn't hesitate you were like yeah okay yeah i would choose this mm -hmm. and 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 so so that's based on your preferences in the same way i could say oh taylor um would you rather have a brand new ferrari or a bugatti and i don't know if you know but those are like two fancy cars if you could choose one, maybe you'd want to see a picture of them. I don't know. But but you could, even though they're not affordable, right? Your 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 preferences extend. Or if I said, oh, imagine that you, you had a billion dollars tomorrow, what might you purchase, right? And you can Im immediately start to figure those things out, even though it's not at all affordable to you today. I don't know, Maddie, you're, you're not a billionaire, are you, Taylor? No. No, okay. So, so, but you, but, but you, do you get what I mean? That your preferences go beyond what your constraints are? Yeah, I get it. Okay, okay. Do you have any questions about that? Not right now. Okay, okay. So the, the next thing that I wanna show you all is the standard representation that we use of um, the budget and consumption set. So normally what economists do is they confine their discussion to only two goods. And, and so um, we'll say, this is good so I'll, I'll 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 talk to somebody else for a minute and see if they can give me a little bit of inspiration um so wombly how are you doing this morning i'm good okay so um can you pick two goods for us that you might choose between like any two goods? Yeah, pick two goods, any two yeah. goods. I guess like a, maybe like a flannel versus like a hoodie or something. Oh, okay. So I mean, I don't know if you're thinking expensive or what we're thinking. Uh, hey, it doesn't, you could probably find, I don't know if you ever buy, so, so my daughters like to go to, to PacSun. That's one of their favorite stores. And I don't know if you've ever been there or not, right? Yeah. All right. And some flannels and hoodies there. Yeah. And I'm sure you could like get something there that was a flannel or hoodie that um, was very expensive if you wanted to. Yeah. Um, and or like one of the ones that I don't know if they sell this at Paxson, but like the Supreme stuff. It's they, they probably have some expensive stuff, like some like collaborations with other brands and stuff, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, I, the one I know of is Brandy Melville. One one size fits all. Um, so <laughs> anyway, um, 
but yeah, so 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 we could do flannels and hoodies. That's fine. I was thinking about it because it was cold now, so it's been on my mind. Uh, uh, yeah, but I'm so thankful that it's it's cold, right? Yeah, me because too. I'm, I'm much better. So notice, so this is what we would call your consumption space, right? And normally we'll just say it's, you know, good X and good Y, and they could be any two goods. Um, sometimes we'll call them even X sub one and X sub two. Um, but um, it, it turns out, right, that rarely do you actually consume only flannels and hoodies, right? You have other clothes and other goods you consume too. So, so you might wonder to yourself, well, how, how general is this model if we're always just talking about two goods? I, I mean, it's a reasonable question, right? Yeah. Well, it turns out that you can extend it to any number of goods. It's just that the graph gets more complicated. And it also turns out that even, and if you were to take more advanced microeconomics um, and, you know, like in the master's program and things like that, then, then you, would, you would see the extension to any number of goods. And, um, and, and then at that point in time, uh, you really can't graph anything because you're doing something in the N dimensional space and there's no good representation for it. But what you would be happy to find out is that everything that you learned about this two dimensional simple example carries over to the uh, multi-dimensional example. So the fact that we're dealing with just two goods isn't really a limitation. And the other thing that I'll point out is that usually when people are doing this type of analysis, they're, they're interested in one thing, like um, you're the producer of flannels, right? And, and you wanna know what the demand for flannels is gonna be. Even if it's one of the products in your product line, suppose that, that you're a clothing manufacturer and you do produce hand, flannels and hoodies, but you're trying to um, forecast the demand for flannels. Well, in that case, you would usually just up here on the y-axis, since, since this is the good you're interested in and this is your main or your principal axis, you would normally just graph flannels down here. And on the y-axis, you would graph um, everything else. And you might think like, well, why would we put like y is equal to everything else? And, and so when we do this, we're saying, why is, and again, you don't have to do this. I'm just telling you what happens in practice most of the time. Um, so in, in that case, why would be what we call a composite consumption good. And, and composite just means it's composed, it's made up of a bunch of other goods all pressed together. But the cool thing about having composite consumption good, and let's see if I can get this thing to drag out a little bit better, is that with the composite consumption good, you can also assume that the price is exactly one dollar and when we assume a good with a price of one dollar there's another word that that comes up which will you'll see in a lot of econ textbooks which is numeraire and it's a french word so i can't tell you much more than that but 
it means that the price is always exactly a dollar. And, and so when you end up making decisions in this consumption space where you have flannels against everything else, then there are some very nice properties with having this price fixed at a dollar. Um, basically, you end up with a clear representation of what share of your budget you're going to end up spending on this specific good and how much money in your budget you're going to reserve for everything else. So if, if you're just interested in trying to forecast the demand for one good like flannels, or if you're an analyst for some company that you know, produces chicken or something like that, then you can do all of these really um, nice, simple analyses that really just focus on the good that you're interested in. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm waiting for a response. Yes, that does. Sorry, I wasn't sure if you're waiting for me. Or like a general yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but still, we'll go back to the 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 your example, which is hand, uh, flannels versus hoodies, uh, which is you know just to be more concrete. But I just want to to make the point here that even though we're doing these kind of what you might call like toy examples that all of the techniques that we're using um, are applicable to very, very um, serious analyses that, that go on um, in, in all sorts of professional um, economics types, type of, of jobs. Okay, so, um, so uh, help me out a little bit more. I'm going to draw a point here. And can you tell me what that point means in this consumption space? Uh, yeah, to me, it seems like the, the person or like the point whoever represents prefers the hoodies because it's higher on the, you know, the axis of the hoodies than further on the axis of the flannels. Uh, okay, so I'm going to do a little bit of labeling here. I'm just trying to grab that graph because I want you all to um, make sure that you know this term. So this is our uh, space, okay? So the consumption space is, is um, all of consists of all of these points. We're not going to label all of them. They're just all the potential um, um, levels of consumption. So you're saying you thought this indicated some sort of a preference, but I was going for something a little bit simpler than that. And and so whenever I have a point, right in in um, you know, a, a plane, this is just a Cartesian plane, then it's going to have a, an X value, right? And yeah. a Y value, it's going to have this ordered pair. And, and these ordered pairs are going to tell me that I'm in a, a location and that location can be represented by a value on the x-axis, right? And I'll try to add a value on the y-axis, right? So that's, let me try to get rid of this arrow. Okay, so that's what I, I, I was getting at. And, and so, so this x-value, right? Um, is going to be ultimately some number, like let's say 20. Oh, sorry, that's Y. Y, 20. And the X value down here, let's say is 10, right? So, so this point in the consumption space, right? 
points to a quantity of hoodies, 20 hoodies, and 10 flannels. Right? Yes. Yeah. And we haven't said the consumer is going to choose that point. It's just that's what these points are. Um, and what economists call these, these points in consumption space, the, the common phraseology is they're a bundle of goods. So this point in consumption space is a bundle, right? Uh, a, a collection or a group of goods that represents 20 hoodies and 10 flannels. So if the consumer owned this point in consumption space, they would have 20 hoodies and 10 flannels. Does that make, does that make sense? Yes, that does. Okay, so um, now obviously there are, or maybe not obviously, but I'll go ahead and, and draw a new graph. And just to, to show you the other way, um, and make this a little bit more general is a lot of times we'll just label this X one and we'll label this one X two, that's common. Um, if you see it, don't get confused. It's just an, another way of referring to what's on um, the vertical axis. But I'm gonna go back to the Y and the, and the X more generally because most of the the stuff um, that's in the recorded lectures you'll see deals with X and Y as being the two goods. And um, now I'll draw a whole bunch of consumption bundles or points in the consumption space. And so I didn't label all of them. I just labeled, I don't know, there's about a dozen there, right? Um, and, and, and the point is, or one of the points is that anytime we're moving away from the origin, which is zero units of both goods, if I'm moving the consumption bundles that are away from the origin, then I'm identifying consumption bundles that contain more of both goods. As I move in that direction, okay. So, and is that clear, Wombly? If I if I pick a point like this one out here, that's going to have more flannels and more hoodies compared to a point like this one over here. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So so our consumption space has all of these points in it, and again, most of the time they won't be points that are labeled for most problems that you might solve, you're only gonna label the ones that are, are interesting. But you have this general idea that how the, the graphing in the consumption space works, what the points mean. And, and in particular, you're gonna pay attention to 
um, that as you move in this, uh, what you would call northeasterly direction, then you're increasing the the amount of of both goods that are in consumption bundles. So you get more stuff as you move to the northeast. And so then the, the, the next thing that we do is um, we begin to divide this consumption space and say, well, okay, here's all of the things that could be consumed, but not all of those things are affordable, okay? And so the, the way that, that we get to that, and I'll show you in a minute, what I've just drawn is a uh, representation of the budget constraint, or sometimes it's called the budget line. But before we get there, I, I just want to be clear what this means is that, that if we had a line here that represented the budget constraint, then we would have all of these points that are either on or below the line. And that would be this area here. Are you still with me, Wombly? Yes, I am. So this, this, this area down here would be what we would call our affordable set, which would mean given our budget, we could purchase anything either on or below the line. So, um, I'll just label this as affordable set. So our affordable set of consumption bundles. And draw a little picture there. Okay. Now everything that's beyond our budget line is unaffordable. All the stuff out there. Okay. So, <clears throat> Now I'll draw, and Wombly, I don't know if you had any questions about that, but- no, that makes sense, right? Like that has to do with the budget constraint, obviously, which we just talked about a second ago. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So, so now I wanna um, show you a, a, an equation that, that captures this idea of the budget, and then I'll show, the, show you the associated graph. So how do we, represent the budget um, algebraically, okay? Well, you have a budget, we're just gonna call it B number of dollars, right? And it turns out that if you think about what's an affordable, it means that your budget has to be greater than or equal to the amount of money that you want to spend, right? Does, it, does that representation of, of affordability make sense to you? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what we, we then do is we'll just use the symbol B. Sometimes they use I for income. And I don't know if you remember this, Wombly, but do you remember how you express um, in macro national income, what symbol you normally use? No, I forgot. That was like a year and a half ago, sorry. That's why. So for GDP, Y equals C plus I plus G. And, oh, and yeah. y, y 
represents um, as one measure of national income is, is, is GDP. So anyway, I just want to let you know, there are different symbols that can be used either I or Y or B for the budget, just depending upon the context. Right now, I'm just going to use um, B, uh, but later on, I'm going to switch to I for income. So don't get confused. So I'm going to say you have a budget of B dollars, right? And that has to be greater than or equal to the amount that you're going to spend on two goods. So how might I, I represent your spending on the two goods? Well, um, so let's, let, let's talk about this um, wombly. So suppose you buy 10 flannels and the price for each flannel is $25, right? What's your yeah. total spending on flannels? 250. Yeah. So, and how did you get that? You just multiplied the price of a flannel times the quantity of flannels purchased, right? Yes. So, so for us, um, so yeah, spending is price times quantity, but we're going to have two goods here. So we're going to say, what's going to be the price in flannels where our X good times the amount of X's, right? That's our quantity of X's. That's our spending on flannels. And the spending on hoodies, well, that's our the price on the Y axis because hoodies was our Y good times the amount of why we purchased. Do you see that? Yeah. So, so this is our total spending on two goods. So we've just taken this common sense way of explaining what's affordable. Well, you got to have more money than you spend on whatever you want to purchase for it to be affordable. And then we break it down into this algebraic relationship by saying, well, when we're spending, we're actually buying a certain amount of stuff and we multiply by the price and that's how much we spent on it. And we do that for two goods and this is our total spending for two goods, okay? So, so now we have this inequality here and I'll go back a little bit and, and you, I don't know if you remember and you probably haven't done it in a while. I don't, I don't think that most people do it except for like in eighth grade, like graphing inequalities. But, but you can see here that graphing the inequality actually means all of this area. It's going to be the line and everything below it. And so we could continue on with um, using the inequality, but for our purposes, we know ultimately what we're interested in is our boundary for that set that identifies the inequality. So I'm just gonna say, I just wanna identify those things that um, exhaust my budget. And that means where I've spent everything. And so I'm gonna get rid of the x and this equation right here is what we call the budget constraint or budget line okay so Let me drag it out a little bit. So does that make sense why I did that? Because um, that way I don't, I don't have to drag around this inequality. Yeah. Okay. So this is gonna identify the boundary. And what you might also notice 
at this point is that this boundary equation has the same form as a general linear equation. You might remember a general a linear, linear equation looks like this, a x plus b y is equal to c. So can you can can you tell that that that's the same form? Yeah. Okay, and 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 maybe it'll help if I carry around the multiplication symbol a little bit um, for a little while. But yeah, so they're the same form. But we know for graphing, right? We want to have things in in slope intercept form. So um, in, in order to put things in slope intercept form, you might remember, so slope intercept form is generally y is equal to mx plus b, right? So we want to get um, our y on the other side in order um, to have things in slope intercept form, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, so um, if we're going to do that, we would subtract B from both sides and we would subtract P times Y from both sides. And I'll just do like an, an intermediate step here. Um, so hopefully everybody uh, follows along. And you just tell me if this makes sense to you, Wombly, if my algebra is at all confusing. I, I'm gonna, now I'm gonna put the minus B first, and then I'm gonna put PX times X. So does, does that make sense to you, Wombly? Yeah, and then I mean, we just divide by the PY, right? Or... Yeah, 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 the negative PY. Yeah. Right, so the negative, signs are important here because now um, we're going to end up with y is equal to our budget divided by the price of y and that's going to be our vertical intercept term and then we'll end up with minus this price ratio px divided by py times x okay and and this is the the form of um the budget line that we want to deal with because we can we can graph it easily so let's go ahead and and we'll go ahead and get rid of this stuff, hopefully. I can just shove it over to the side here and it won't give you too much trouble. Or maybe it will. Okay. All right, that's good. And I'll get rid of some of these labels. Okay. And then so on the vertical axis here, we said we would have whatever our budget was divided by PY. One of the things that that you might notice is that, and I'll put the vertical intercept here as an orange dot. Or well, I guess it's gonna come out as a purple dot. That's okay. As a purple dot. So can you interpret that purple dot for me, Wombly? It's a consumption bundle. 
right? Yeah. So I can interpret it like in terms of that, it would mean that the quantity for y would be way higher than the, the quantity for x would be zero. Yeah. So so that would be what's affordable, right? If you yeah. spend all of your income on only purchasing in your example hoodies okay and you purchase no flannels right yeah the the coordinates for this point are x is equal to zero like you said and y is equal to your entire budget divided by the price of y and if you think about that that means that you spent all of your money i mean if you if you're you're like oh, I walk into the store and I have a hundred bucks, right? And I see that the price of hoodies is $20, right? How many hoodies can I buy if I purchase only hoodies? Well, you got a hundred bucks, they're 20 bucks a piece. Forget about taxes, right? You can buy at most, how many hoodies? hundred yeah you can buy most five right so you spend all your money just on hoodies you'd end up at that point right there now over here you can't really see it very clearly from this equation but now that you have the intuition and i can tell you this would be the case so this is that's our vertical intercept this is our horizontal intercept what do you think that value is That one would be spending all of it on X or flannels versus not spending any of it on Y, but it's still affordable. Yeah, right. So if you purchased flannels and only flannels, you'd end up at that point there. And do you know what it would be? Um, well, I guess it, with the money you said, it would be like five and then zero. Well, right? I was going to say, I was gonna say oh. it's going to be this. See, oh, yeah, like yeah, the, yeah. No. your budget divided by the price of X. Yeah. Right. Um, and and so hopefully, like the the intuition is starting to click here, so you can nail down these points. Yeah. And and understand what they mean. So I'll just put an orange dot over there. Okay. So now we have these two anchor points for our budget, and then there are all these other points in between. The only thing I wanna point out for the points in between, right, is that as we move down the budget line, um, well, what I wanna do is make this up. Is that, this is our slope, right? This corresponds to, and hopefully you can see in the equation here, this corresponds to the M in our Y is equal to MX plus B. We just wrote our intercept term first, which is normally what you wanna do when you wanna graph these things um, easily. But we have this, this negative slope, which is the price ratio. And so the slope of this line, if we are at any particular point and we wanna move down, because slope is rise over run, right? Then that slope, is minus px over py based on our equation. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. Now I see how the equation works. So, so what this tells me is so a little bit of meditation on slope, like slope is rise over run and 
So we can write slope as uh, the change in, which is going to be our delta y over our delta x, our change in x, right? And in our case, um, the the slope is negative, so it means we're going to go down as we purchase more x, we are forced to purchase less y, right? If I start off saying, I'm, well, I can purchase five hoodies, but now I wanna purchase one flannel, that means I have to give up purchasing some amount of hoodies. And this slope tells me if I let dx, right, the amount of flannels I'm gonna purchase be equal to one, then the slope value tells me dy or how much I have to give up in this case of y to get one additional x. I'd have to give up whatever the price ratio difference was. So, you know, if we, if, if we do a simple example and we say that uh, a flannel costs ten dollars, and and a hoodie costs twenty dollars. Then every time I I purchase an additional flannel, I have to give up a half of a hoodie, right? Um, and I know you're probably going to get a little bit stuck on the idea that that maybe um, you know our our hoodies. Um, divisible in the sense that that we could have a half of a hoodie don't get stuck on that right now um, let's just assume that that you can purchase a half a hoodie because in most of the analysis that we want to do the idea of whether or not the goods are divisible doesn't matter so so having a half a hoodie is just fine don't don't worry about that but it's important that you understand that this this division of the prices um, tells us how much of the Y good we have to give up in order to um, purchase some amount of the X good and still stay on this budget line. Okay. Now, so, so, so this is everything that we need to know in order to solve our consumer choice problem about the first part, which is the budget constraint. So when we get together next time, and um, again, we'll, we'll talk um, about review material for as long as you all want to. And um, I have other lectures that I can assign that explain preferences and budgets and stuff like that. And we can continue to move forward on the consumer choice problem, um, you know, even leading up to our exam, so we don't lose too much time in review. But um, if we have time next time, then I'll close the loop and um, we'll do the next part, which is uh, talking about um, how how we can then introduce preferences. And, and find out, come up with an exact prediction of which of the affordable consumption bundles the consumer will actually purchase. And that's our, our first goal is we wanna say, okay, I know your budget, I know your preferences, this is what you're going to Mr. or Miss Consumer, this is what you're going to uh, purchase. Okay. Um, do you have any questions for me, Wombly, or anybody else? No, I think I understand at least the budget constraint part for now. Budget yeah. And um, 